My name is Alyssa and I am the education coordinator at the Lincoln Children's Zoo and this is my associate, Nathan. He is the lead education specialist of the zoo. And as you probably guessed by our outfits, we are from the Lincoln Children's Zoo and we are here today to talk to you about endangered animals. So, who has heard of the phrase endangered animals before? Raise your hand. Good, we have a lot of people that are aware of endangered animals. And since you've heard about it, I will give you a quick update, a very general explanation of what that is. An endangered animal is an animal that we just don't have a lot of in the wild, or its population is starting to decline. And endangered animals, we have lots of different ways of classifying them, going from extinct all the way up to least concern. So we also have animals that are extinct in the wild, critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, going all the way up to least concern. So animals of least concern, I think all the animals we brought today are actually animals, now animals of least concern. Some of them were endangered at one time. So we have lots of reasons that we have animals that are endangered. Starting out with deforestation and habitat loss. Animals have to have a habitat to live in, right? You guys have to have a house to live in. I mean, technically you don't, but it makes life a whole lot better if you're living in a nice, comfortable house. If animals lose their homes, they don't have any place to live. They stop making more animals, and their populations decline or even disappear altogether. Hunting and poaching. Hunting and poaching is not necessarily a bad thing. If you need, well, poaching is. Hunting, if you have a bunch of deer and they're destroying the environment, they're eating all the grass, destroying all the food for other animals. We do need to go in and hunt them to get the population in check. But if we have two white rhinos living out in the wild and some guy says, man, I wish I had a white rhino head in my office, it would just go so well with the decor. And he goes out, shoots one of those white rhinos, guess what? That species is done for because you need two rhinos to make more and unfortunately, now you're down to one. Climate change. So as temperatures change, like with the woolly mammoth and the saber-toothed tiger, when the weather got a lot nicer, guess what? They didn't, their fur was attached to them. It wasn't like a coat that they could take off. They got too hot and then they went bye-bye. So that is an important factor in deciding which species live and survive. Disease, if an animal gets sick and spreads it to all their other animals, guess what? Goodbye. It happens with people too. In the medieval times when the bubonic plague happened in Europe, it wiped out a huge amount of the population. Overexploitation. So that one's probably a little weird. You might have heard of all the other ones before. Overexploitation is when people specifically use an animal so much that that animal starts to decline or it affects that animal's population. And the first animal we are going to bring out is an example of that. It is Skittles, our Colombian black and white tegu. And a lot of you seem really interested in her. Raise your hand if you think it would be cool to have a giant lizard as a pet. Quite a few people in here. Well, I'm going to tell you guys a few facts about her, and then we will see how many people raise their hands at the end. So, as you can see, she's a pretty big lizard. Guess what? She's still relatively young. I think she's about three years old. When she's full grown, she can be four to five feet long. That's one big hunk of lizard. And where are you gonna keep that lizard in your house? You need to actually keep her in something. You can't just let her walk free because guess what? She can't be potty trained like a cat or a dog. So when she goes, she goes everywhere and it's super gross and super stinky. And you probably do not want that happening in your house. So really for most of you, the only appropriate place you would have would probably be your bathtub. And I have a feeling that your parents would probably not agree to taking a bath with a giant lizard. I know I wouldn't and I work at a zoo. I have to draw the line somewhere. So she's a really awesome looking lizard, but she eats a lot of really disgusting things. What she eats is mice, insects, and even baby chicks. So her diet is super duper gross. And most people do not want to feed an animal that. She is an omnivore, mostly a carnivore. So she needs to eat meat. If you feed her cereal or plants or something that she's not designed to eat, it will make her sick and she will pass away. So you might have seen when she came around, did she stick her tongue out at you? She's not trying to be rude. 
She is just trying to sense her surroundings. So she has something in her head called a Jacobson's organ. Snakes also have it. A lot of animals have it. We even, to some sense, have a modified version of it. And that, many people say that that's how they smell. And that's kind of true. It is linked to her sense of smell, but it's more like a way of gathering information. So her tongue is forked. She brings that tongue into, she gets the little molecules that float around in the air, grabs those on her tongue, brings it into her head, and sticks it kind of up in the roof of her mouth. And it's sort of like if you have two thumb drives on your computer, sticking them in there, getting, and she downloads all the information into her brain about the surrounding area. So she can smell if there's food, she can smell if there's a boy lizard in the room, she can smell all kinds of really cool things or sense them with that Jacobson's organ. So other cool things about her is that she is actually an ectotherm. Who's ever heard of the word ectotherm? Anyone? Who's heard of cold-blooded? There we go. I'm gonna prepare you guys for your future. By the time you get to high school and college, no one says cold-blooded anymore. It's kind of like a passe term. It's like YOLO, no one says it anymore. So what we say is ectotherm, and it's a much more scientific way of describing things because ecto means outside and therm means heat, like a thermostat, a thermos, or a thermometer. So outside heat. So she needs to have a really warm environment. You would find her in the wild in South America in tropical forests where she would be nice and warm. If you live, if you get one of these and you don't keep them warm enough, she needs that heat to help her digest her food. So if she sits there and you feed her and she doesn't have a lot of heat, or the food's just gonna sit in her stomach and make her sick. So most importantly is how we got Skittles. So if you think about it, when you go to a pet store, you don't always know where they get the animals from. With her, we do, she came from another zoo, thankfully. But sometimes guys go down into South America, pick up a bunch of lizards off the ground, think, oh, how much fun would these be as pets? Stick them in a bag, ship them to the United States, and sell them in pet stores. And that's really bad because if everyone decided that they wanted to have a giant lizard as a pet, guess what? In the wild, there would be no more lizards. And thankfully, these do breed in captivity, but a lot of animals don't. Like cheetahs, it's really, really difficult to breed them in captivity. So when people take them from the wild, you're not going to have any more cheetahs. You wouldn't have any more awesome lizards. So it's very important that you make conscious decisions about your pet ownership. So who still wants a giant lizard? Maybe. We still have a few people. But I bet after a week of cleaning up, cleaning up after her, we should do rent a lizard and see how that goes. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to move on to our next critter, Stella the skunk. Her stinker or scent gland has been removed. However, if she did still have it, me, you, if I were a skunk, I could get you right in the face from 10 feet away, but I wouldn't. And that would actually not be my first line of defense if I were a skunk, believe it or not. Everyone's afraid about uh, being sprayed by a skunk. Her very first line of defense is actually something that she doesn't even have control over. It is the color of her fur. So you might have noticed when I put that picture up on the screen, you saw bright black and white coloration. That is warning coloration to tell other animals and people like us to stay away. Other things she does before she sprays, she will puff herself up really, really big, stomp her feet like this, and boop, 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 scuttle around. And that's to scare off other predators. And she actually has to make herself look really, really big because, believe it or not, she's a very petite skunk. She's only three and a half pounds. And skunks usually are five to 15 pounds. So she's a very teeny tiny little skunk. And if she were to get very, very mad and you didn't back away and she was going to spray you, she would only have about six sprays in her. And then once she uses up all of her scent, it would take 10 days for her to remake that. And a lot of energy on her part. So she really doesn't want to have to spray you if she doesn't have to. And skunks are really cool animals because they clean up after us. So they eat garbage, they eat just about everything. She has a little walking trash compactor. And if you don't want skunks in your yard, because unfortunately not all skunks are as sweet as Stella or as scentless as Stella, there's a really easy thing you can do. 
You guys have trash cans at your house? Do you put a lid on your trash can when it's outside? Excellent. If you don't put a lid on your trash can, that is an open invitation to all kinds of creepy crawly critters. Also, picking up after yourself garbage. She, I mentioned before, is a little trash eater. She loves to eat everything. I don't know how many times I used to live at a summer camp and I would walk out at night and I would see a skunk's tail hanging out of a Doritos bag almost every night. And guess what? Doritos aren't particularly healthy for us. They are definitely not healthy for skunks. And it's going to bring all of her and her buddies over if you just have an entire buffet of food laid out at your front yard. Or if you go camping and you leave a bunch of food out at your campsite, you're just asking for trouble. I mean, unless you want to frolic among the skunks, but usually, usually most people don't want to see a skunk when they go camping. All right, you also can see that she has very long claws. They are not sharp, and we do trim them at the zoo, but we do keep them a little bit longer because she does like to use them for digging things out. She will dig things like worms and slugs and all kinds of creepy crawly critters. She'll dig up and eat them. She has a terrible sense of eyesight though. She has those tiny little beady eyes because she's nocturnal. Do you guys remember what nocturnal means? Active at night, yep. So she doesn't really need to see well. Birds of prey have really big eyes though at night because they're up high so they can still see. They can take in the moonlight and see things but she's down really, really low. She pretty much only sees feet in her life at the zoo. But our next creature has a really cool conservation story. It is Calvin, the North American alligator. And alligators, we, they seem very plentiful now. If you guys have ever been down to Florida, Louisiana, South Carolina, Georgia, they're everywhere. They're all over the swamps. But in the 1950s and 60s, that was not the case. People were very, very filthy back then, and we just threw our trash everywhere. We threw it into the water. We put paint down the drains. We made their habitats, the alligators' habitats, absolutely awful. So their population went declined and they almost, they became endangered and almost became extinct. Then in the 1970s and 1980s, we realized that we need to get our act together and start cleaning up after ourselves. So we didn't pour our waste into the swamps anymore. We did not pour paint down the drains. We started to conserve water and protect the swamp habitat because swamps are really, really important. Swamps are where extra water goes when it rains. If we don't have swamps, flooding can occur. Lots and lots of flooding. So we understood the importance of swamps. Also, swamps breed and become homes to lots of very unpleasant things, to insects, to, to rats, all kinds of stuff that we really don't want living in our houses. And guess what Calvin takes care of for us? Calvin and his buddies take care of all those unpleasant creatures in the swamp. Once we cleaned up our act and the alligator population went back up, people decided around the same time that it would be really cool to get 12 foot snakes as pets or 16 foot snakes as pets. Unfortunately, for many of those people that got those pets, the people that they lived with disagreed and said, no, honey, you are not bringing a 16 foot snake into this house. I'm sorry, but this will be, this is not going to go over well, let it go. So because Florida is really nice and the people thought that they were doing the right thing most of the time, said, you know what? I can't take care of Jimmy, my seven foot snake right now. So I'll just let him go into the wild. He'll find plenty to eat. And oh yeah, Jimmy did find plenty to eat. And guess what he ate? Little tiny Calvins when they hatch out. So now alligators are on the decline, mainly because people get these ridiculously large pets and set them free. And they are not native to that area. You guys heard about the word native before? That is when something is supposed to be there. It was originally there, it's made its home there, it's lived there for hundreds of years, everything's good. When you bring a non-native species in, however, it takes that ecosystem and throws it all out of balance. And animals that used to be able to survive now have a predator that they didn't have before, and they have to deal with that animal, and not all the time they're able to survive. Calvin 
is quite a survivor, however, and all of, the, all of them really are, as long as they don't have giant snakes trying to eat them. He has webbed feet that make him an excellent swimmer. He has kind of a fat tail, and he stores fat in that tail, so if he does have to skip a meal or can't find food, it's like having a granola bar in his backside so he can just go a day or two without eating. He also has this thing called a nictitating membrane, or a third eyelid, that goes over his eye and acts like swim goggles. How cool would that be if you guys could just go like that and go swimming and see right underwater? I know if I had to pick an, an adaptation, I would choose that one. He also has his nose on top of his head and his eyes on top of his head too. So when he's waiting for food or looking out for predators, he can go under the water and have his nose up and breathe. That would also be helpful, but I think I would look kind of ridiculous with my nose on top of my forehead. So he has all of these things that make him quite a survivor. And you guys can do things to help, help keep Calvin well too, because water is everywhere. And you guys know about the water cycle and how it spreads. Something that we do here in Nebraska can actually affect the water down in Florida. So when you brush your teeth, turn the water off after you wet your toothbrush. And also if you've got things like paint or pesticides, take them to a place where they can be properly processed and not thrown into our main water supply. And you won't just be helping Calvin, you'll be helping yourself and everyone around you too because everyone likes to have fresh water to drink. All right, so Renzo is a prehensile tail porcupine. And prehensile means that he has an extra appendage, in this case his tail, that acts like an additional hand. So he can hold on to things. Specifically for him, it's trees and tree branches because he's an arboreal animal. And arboreal, like Arbor Day, means trees. <laughs> As you can see, he's very, very sweet and very charming. One of his, two of his most distinctive features are his quill and his nose. So his quills, do not worry, he cannot shoot his quills out. I would not bring any animal here that was gonna go pew, 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 and shoot quills at you because I would have to answer way too many parent phone calls. <laughs> he is a very, very sweet creature. He will not shoot his quills. He cannot shoot them. His quills do have barbs on them. So if you've ever been fishing and you've seen that little like extra hook on the tip of the fishing, the fishing hook, that helps keep fish from going off of your fishing hook. It actually, the little tiny barbs keep those quills in an animal if he were to back up into them. So he actually has to back into the animal to fill it with quills, because he cannot shoot them. He does have muscles attached to all of his quills though, so he can lift them up and down, up and down. So when he gets angry, he'll lift up his quills. Right now, he's pretty chill. He's got his quills fairly relaxed. He's in a happy mood because he's getting one of his favorite treats, a banana. Another very distinguished feature about him is his lovely nose. I'll give you guys a hint about all animals in the wild. If you look at an animal's face and you see a feature about them and it's really big or exaggerated, usually that is their strongest scent so, or sense. So his strongest sense is his scent sense and his nose. He does have tiny little beady eyes because just like the skunk, he's also nocturnal. He does not have a particularly good sense of eyesight, but has an excellent sense of smell, an excellent sense of balance. He does have that black and white coloration I was talking about with the skunk as well. And that is a warning. He also has a little bit of yellow, which in the rainforest, yellow means stay away from me. And these guys are considered a pest in South America because as you can see, he absolutely loves bananas. People build banana plantations and plant banana plantations. And those farmers get super angry because guess what? If you had a whole bunch of bananas growing in your yard and they were your favorite food, of course you'd climb up that tree and steal all those bananas. He doesn't know that they don't belong to him. So a lot of hunters will shoot them, unfortunately. However, he doesn't have many other predators in the wild because, I mean, honestly, would you want to eat a steak if it were covered in porcupine quills? I wouldn't. Yeah, he's not too appetizing to them. So other cool things about Renzo are, if you notice his feet, they have like a little callus on them or a pad, and that helps him grip onto the tree. So he's getting kind of a little nervous now, so we're probably going to put him back. 
Also, every time you guys visit the zoo, you help out our animals because we have things called SSPs or species survival programs where we have we specifically help snow leopards, red pandas, and the tree kangaroos, who are animals that are endangered or critically endangered. And we breed them at our zoo and we give those animals to other zoos. And hopefully someday, if we get enough animals in captivity, we'll be able to start releasing them into the wild because the ultimate goal is for the animals to go back to where they came from and live out their lives in a natural habitat.